Good afternoon and welcome to this week's edition of Halftime Talk. And I'm delighted to be joined in our feature interview with Mikhail Maidan, Head of China Energy Research at the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies. Thank you, Mikhail, for joining us today. Thank you, Sean, for having me. I suppose any day of the week, any week of the year, uh, whatever the question is, the answer is China. So uh, it seems that's once again the case. Uh, last year it was because China was closed. All of these issues and problems existed in the world. And now China's opened and it's another whole series of challenges. I'm wondering from your perspective, are you buying into the general narrative, the general energy narrative, uh, and, and probably more macro than just energy, that this will be a year of two halves, China will reopen, get its feet in the first half, but the engines will really start churning in the second half and with it sort of full consumption of all of the commodities that it is well used to consuming pre-COVID? I think it's certainly a year of two halves. I definitely buy into that with a relatively slow kind of things getting back on track. We don't have data on COVID. We don't have data on second waves if there are any, but one might expect that that was, would be the case. Um, I did, and we are a bit more cautious, I think, than the markets have been from the beginning of the year. I think there was a huge amount of exuberance around this sort of China reopening trade and expecting China to go back to previous sort of big boom cycles where there was big infrastructure stimulus and a huge amount, a huge increase in activity. I think we were and remain slightly more cautious on that front because this opening was always going to be a bit more complicated. If you think about local government finances, all they've had to spend on health and welfare, declining revenues from real estate, there just isn't enough money in the kitty to spend on a big infrastructure stimulus. And that wasn't the plan. The plan was really for consumption to be the big driver of growth. Even that is a bit of a mixed bag. I mean, if you look at the data so far, we have seen, I use the word revenge spending quite cautiously, we have seen more consumer activities, but not a big uptick in uh, sales of consumer goods, for instance. So mobility, demand for again gasoline, jet, all of those was up quite strongly, but consumers still remain cautious. And this notion that China's opened up and again, revenge spending will be massive. China internally was open for the better part of the past three years. We did have lockdowns last year, but there's the baselines are different. And so I think we have to be a little bit careful about our expectations. So, and of course, we didn't have the same model as we had in in the G7 or certainly in, in, in the Western economies where the governments gave a lot of stimulus to the population. I mean, literally mailed them checks to spend uh, China's population didn't receive checks from their government so they don't end up coming out of covid with a big lump of disposable income to burn i mean interestingly they didn't receive checks you're right they do have disposable income but they're worried about burning it i think mm -hmm. some of it they've moved their savings you look at the various data um savings are up disposable incomes probably flat but a huge amount of caution because the real estate sector is weak because the private sector is still um, slightly worried about the political wins and the extent to which there will or will not be crackdowns again. All of these are big drivers of employment. We're seeing youth unemployment really high in China. So again, a huge amount of concern by consumers about their future. When you look at the PMI data that's come out uh, of China in recent weeks, we see the manufacturing uh, PMIs are, are low and disappointing, but the services are robust and, 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 and growing, it would appear. Is this the new China that we just have to get used to and that indeed maybe the leadership in China is happy to see this uh, divergence? I mean, certainly the plan has been to encourage more consumption, right? It's about being more self-sufficient. It's about increased productivity as, as the demographic trends are showing a decline in population. That's clearly the plan. But I think what we need to get used to is not 
so much uh, a service oriented China, but actually a China with quite a bit of policy volatility and sort of this mixed bag and mixed messages. Again, we don't know that the consumer or that the service industry is really taking over and is driving growth. Um, you know, the, the National Bureau of Statistics has this index of sort of China's new economy, the digital economy, electric vehicles. That's been that's roughly 17 percent of GDP and maybe 10 percent of growth. So the kind of old economy of infrastructure and real estate is still a really big driver of growth. And without that, we're not going to see, you know, GDP growth exceeding the kind of around 5 percent that the government is talking about. We're not seeing this big surge. I think it's too soon to say that China's really changed its economic model. I think what we can say again is that these mixed messages and policy volatility are here to remain. That's very confusing for energy markets, both within China and outside of it. But when you take this number, 5%, that is presented, ultimately driven by the 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 communist party the leadership of china they set a target and everybody's meant to row the boats to meet that target do we i mean how much are we operating still in the dark here data reliable data or, or is it sentiment driven okay now it's open so we assume there's activity and it's closed so we assume i mean how reliable are the data points to really be guided from the point of view of the the vibrancy and the challenges of the of the economic model that is China today, perennial question of data. I think you know official data we have to work with it. I think it is getting better, especially in the energy sector and in oil markets where there was so much tax avoidance and evasion that skewed the data considerably. We've had a lot of crackdown on some of those tax practices, which has actually meant that oil data is a bit better. The macro indicators, I think they're probably as good as Beijing gets. So if there is obfuscation or, or you know, creative tax practices on the provincial level, those still filter up to what Beijing gets. Um, I think we have to use that. We have to use anecdotal evidence. We have to use what we're seeing on the ground uh, and try and triangulate all of that. But from what we are seeing so far, you know, yes, travel has recovered very strongly. We've had the Lunar New Year. We've had the May Day travel. So that's gasoline and your jet demand. Infrastructure and industrial activity is harder. I mean, if you look at emissions, you can see that that's up. But that's mostly from the power sector because coal is back. From the oil sector, refining and chemicals are back. Um, cement a little bit, but sort of, again, steel, cement, the real estate sector, construction, infrastructure, those are the ones that are open questions. That's a big question mark for distillate demand, if we're thinking about the oil market, but also for gas demand, because industry is the biggest consumer of gas in China. So, again, we use the data, we look at the data, but we have to triangulate it. We we have one of our regular China commentators on this morning on the uh, the podcast saying that uh, China's crude oil imports have have been much larger than what the customs data show, because a lot of cargoes have been importing in the name of bitumen blend or diluted bitumen, which have been flowing from sanctioned cargoes. Uh, so even at the, the normal sort of co course of events, as you just articulated, are now maybe even murkier uh, with this uh, context of, you know, sanctioned Iranian oil, uh, Russian uh, products and crude. How 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 much is that sort of conf sort of obfuscating the uh, the current picture? If it was just diluted bitumen, I think we'd be in a good position. I mean, if you look at the data we had last year, we had a huge amount of obfuscation through that. And then there was a tax crackdown. This year, it's probably 200, 300,000 barrels a day above average from diluted bitumen. But then you have to add fuel oil, which some of the independent refiners are bringing in. Now, it could be fuel oil as actual feedstock, not crude. Um, but that is they're using that with Iranian condensate and um, Russian and Iranian naphtha as well to use that for feedstocks into chemicals. Um, so, again, you've got sort of potentially higher than than we know output. Um, 
some flows through pipelines, some Russian crude flowing through pipelines from Myanmar and potentially from Kazakhstan that's above capacity and we don't fully know. Um, so I think there are other sources of potential feedstock coming in that we're not fully quantifying, um, but we're probably talking about 500 to 700,000 barrels a day, all in all, within the context of 14 million barrels a day of total consumption, 14, 15 million, it's not huge, but it's still a number to be reckoned with that is creating a lot of uncertainties. But also, if you consider that these feedstocks are coming in, um, then they are weighing on crude demand and potentially crude from the Gulf in particular. When you take a look at the crude demand and the, the outlook for the year, and again, the second half theory that, that demand comes back stronger, although it looks like China is already importing near record levels, uh, the where does the, if you like, the market competition come into place within the Russian Iranian crude opportunity discounted, very attractive uh, versus the uh, Saudi, the Gulf states, of course, China is a very big market for them. Uh, is, is there room for everybody still or could you expect that this China market, which may be approaching peak oil demand given some of these factors that the competition between these partners within OPEC plus might start to cause some fractures what are your thoughts on that and i think for the year it does depend on how strong the growth right and i think at the beginning of the year there were these expectations that crude demand would skyrocket and therefore there'd be room for everyone I mean, you know, our numbers for the year are talking about product rather than crude demand of 700 KBD. So slightly lower, I think, than consensus. But you have new refining starts and you have, you know, a lot of refining activity um, to bring in that crude. I think we do have to look a little bit at who is importing. And there's a big difference between the Shandong independents, who, where I think most of the competition for sanctioned crudes happens, right? Iranian, Venezuelan, Russian barrels versus the state-owned majors that do have to worry about their term contracts, their relationships with Gulf producers. It's not just an oil market thing. It's also a bigger geopolitical concern for the government. And then new refiners, the kind of new mega refiners that are starting up. And again, a lot of them do have term contracts with some of the bigger suppliers and are a bit more cautious about the prospects of secondary sanctions. They're trying to sort of keep away from Again, the more creative tax practices. All that to say is I think there is room for, certainly for the big players, the Gulf players, Russian flows still. Um, but I wouldn't overestimate how much more Russian crude can come into China. I think we're looking at 400, 500 KBD of an increment, which is a lot. But that doesn't completely offset the need for Gulf, uh, for, for Gulf supplies. It doesn't also undermine US supplies either. And if you sort of fast forward, you know, you're talking about peak oil. China still consumes oil for probably another decade. And if you look at the list of suppliers, it does remain with Gulf crudes, Russia, the US. And so if it is thinking forward, and we know that China, the Chinese leaders and Chinese corporates do have a tendency to sort of for longer term planning, they need all of these resources to remain. So, you know, saving a few bucks, so to speak, on discounted crudes this year, um, is still not an important enough consideration for them to undermine longer term relationships and contracts. Just on that point of, of peak oil demand uh, in China, we, we given the context of this structural change, and of course you pointed out that China's economy has not yet really changed uh, that much, although the, the desire is for it to change. Uh, but given uh, the the demographic plateau to decline, given the sort of reorganization of global supply chains moving away from China uh, slowly, but nonetheless, you would say perhaps it's peaked uh, the, the China as the sort of manufacturing center of the world. Uh, and so uh, the move Apple to India being the more headline grabbing one, but we've already had many moves to Vietnam and others because of the cost effectiveness, but supply chain move, uh, 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 et cetera, the, the, the environmental impact uh, currently, obviously coal and notably, but generally the reasons why you can build 
the case why we're getting close to peak oil demand. Do you think that's overcooked? Your thoughts on where that might land? If you look at a lot of the different scenarios, um, we're anywhere, I think the consensus is, again, Chinese oil demand still grows certainly into the 2030s and then peaks, um, with demand being sustained mainly for chemicals. But we had, I don't know if you know Faridin Fesharaki, as I presume you do. Uh, he said at a forum last week in, in Dubai, the, the MPGC, that he saw peak China oil demand in 2026, 2027. Which is yeah, maybe for gasoline and diesel. I think peak oil demand in general. I mean, look at the chemicals complex. You still have a huge amount of oil demand for chemicals that right. continues through the 2030s. I think I think it would be very interesting if his predictions of peak oil demand came true in the next couple of years. I can totally see that for gasoline and diesel, um, mainly for gasoline in the next couple of years. Electrification is gaining pace. But again, even if you think about all the EVs that are added in China, and there are lots of them that are being added, that is new mobility. That isn't taking off existing ICE vehicles from the roads. Um, again, your jet fleet. And most of the demand for transport in China is actually for freight. And there is movement to electrify and to move to rail and to move to maritime transport. But again, that doesn't take your cars and your trucks off the road. And if China does manage to generate it's sort of service industry, and it is moving towards a more consumer and service industry. That is still a lot of goods being moved around, um, you know, e-commerce and trade. You know, China's urbanization is not over, and it probably peaks somewhere towards the 2030s. And all of that, I think, still generates a huge amount of demand for oil. Um, so I think we, we still have, but sort of to your point, I think it's a question of how much. Does it grow by a million barrels a day and then peak? Or does it grow by three million barrels a day and then peak? And then how much does it decline thereafter? But it's interesting. We've been doing a study on this. Most of the scenarios, if you look at Chinese scenarios, IEA, Shell, BP, different levels of growth and then decline, they all still have China as the biggest consumer and importer of oil well into the next decade. And when you intersect into that, the growing sort of geopolitical tensions uh, we, with the U.S. in particular, but now increasingly it looks like Europe's been pulled into that same vortex. Does that impact the Venn diagram with oil demand, oil consumption, growth, uh, or it's just a parallel and will have no impact? I mean, it's probably a parallel. It's hard to say that it will have no impact, but right. what we're seeing already from sort of the Trump tariffs, for instance, yeah. and, you know, efforts to move away from China is that actually China's share of global exports has risen, not fallen. Now, the share of exports to the U.S. has fallen, but a lot of that of those exports are coming from other countries. So stuff that is being produced by Chinese companies or with Chinese inputs in Vietnam, Mexico, you know, and you talked about Europe. Germany, for instance, has been selling much more manufactured goods to the U.S., but it needs Chinese components to do that. So actually, Chinese exports to Germany have increased. I mean, I think there are very few ways around it. If we want to still be producing cheap consumer goods, yes, a lot of that is moving and has already started moving to Southeast Asia and to other countries other than China and you know, companies have been working on a China plus one or a China plus many, but the scale and efficiency that you have in China, the relatively low cost of labor and inputs is still hugely appealing. Now, does that change radically in a decoupled world? Maybe, but then that looks as that is an increasingly inflationary world where we get slower growth all across the board and in China too. Well, the easiest question or the hardest question for last, depending on your point of view, uh, if you were sitting in the OPEC headquarters on the weekend advising how OPEC Plus should plan their second half of the year strategy, uh, would you expect that Saudi are going to have to extend that cut in July or one month will be enough to bridge OPEC Plus into that yummy spot of second half demand out of Asia and China? I mean, I think Saudi still has its market in Asia and whatever it does sort of for the rest of the world, its focus on Asia is critical for its future, right? So cutting demand now 
I think it will have to it will have to raise its flows to China because it wants to remain competitive in that market, no matter what it does to the rest of the world. It will surprisingly be today market. it has risen its prices. It's ro- it's it's uh, its price for uh, crude into Asia for July uh, has gone up. The expectation was going to go down, and they've raised their OSPs. Again, they've got new refining starts. They've got customers that they're working with that will pay the price because they need that crude. But in terms of this sort of immediate quarter ahead, the the idea that OPEC will be cutting going into the second half of the year, which obviously is the seasonal demand rise, regardless of how strong the rise is, but ultimately the cycle is, is upward. Would you expect that, the Saudi cut this unilateral 1 million barrels a day just for July, which was the announcement on Sunday, uh, will be only one month or will it extend? Will they need to uh, open the taps again because demand will be strong? I mean, you've got both the demand and the supply questions, right? It will depend also what happens to Russia and Russia has exceeded supply expectations. Iran hasn't come back to the market. So I think it's the juggling act of both supply and demand. I mean, China's demand this summer could rise for crude, especially if we get power outages again. We already have hydro shortages in Yunnan. So if we get a reversal to backup generation and stronger diesel demand, then we could see a bit of an uptick there. Yes, it's the big unknown. The second half of the year, a lot depends on China from an oil market's point of view. We'll have to wait and see. But I'm afraid we've run out of time on this week's halftime talk, and we're delighted. And thank you to Mikhail Maidan, head of China Energy Research at the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies, for being our guest this week. Thank you.